Hi everyone, thank you guys for joining us today. We are very, very lucky that we have some wonderful members of the Haitian Lawyers Association who are going to share some great information. This is part of our series, Understanding and Serving Caribbean Families in the Legal System. And this is our first part, which is going to be focused on domestic violence cases. So I am going to pass it to Ms. Kasu, who is going to introduce the wonderful panelists and start the presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening. My name is Beatrice Kazo. I am the founder and managing partner of the Law Offices of Kazo and Associates, a family law and personal injury firm handling cases throughout the state of um, Florida. I also serve as special magistrate for the city of North Miami. Um, I graduated from law school from New England Law, Boston Mass in 1999, and I did my undergraduate in criminal justice from John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. Um, I began my legal career as an assistant state prosecutor here in Miami-Dade County, Florida and went into private practice in 2002. I'm also past president of the Haitian Lawyers Association. Um, we have with us tonight, Mark Joseph, who is the founder and owner of the Joseph Firm, a South Florida based practice, focusing exclusively on marital and family law. He is also a Florida Supreme Court certified family mediator and collaborative law practitioner. Mark also serves on the Family Law Section's Domestic Violence Committee, 11th Judicial Circuit Grievance Committee, the Family Law Rules Committee, along with serving on the Florida Bar Family Law Section's Legislative Committee. Mark received both his Bachelor of Arts in Business Administration and his Juris Doctor from the Florida International University and FIU College of Law, respectively. Fritzny Jarbath is the founder and managing partner of Jarbath Enna Law Group. They are a trilingual law firm that handles cases in family law and immigration law in Miami and Broward County. She is on the family law section of the CLE committee. She sits on the board of Kidside, a nonprofit organization dedicated to raising awareness in raising funds for family court services in Miami-Dade County. Fritzney is also past president of the Haitian Large Association. God does not like divorce, even if your husband occasionally beats you. These words spoken in Creole by a pastor during a Sunday sermon at a church that I was visiting. Unfortunately, Victims or survivors of domestic violence often hear similar messages, not just from their religious leaders, but also from well-meaning family members and friends. Domestic violence is prevalent in every community and affects all people, regardless of race, nationality, religion, sexual orientation, social standing, or economic status. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, in the United States, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner, which equates to more than 10 million women and men annually. On a national average, 23.2% of women and 13.9% of men have experienced severe physical violence by an intimate partner during their lifetime. In the state of Florida, the number is 37.9% of women and 29.3% of men experience intimate partner dated violence, intimate partner sexual violence, and or intimate partner stalking in their lifetime. In 2019, 105,298 domestic violence incidents were reported to police in Florida in the black community. 
the number is staggering. 45.1% of black women and 40% of black men have experienced intimate partner physical violence in their lifetime. An estimated 51.3% of black adult female homicides are related to intimate partner violence. Now, as terrible as these statistics are, there are many more cases that go unreported every day. And we are here tonight as Haitian American, as members of the Caribbean to tell you that in Caribbean or Haitian households, the domestic violence cases are not talked about, they are not discussed, and many of the victims suffer in silence. And oftentimes, they, don't, they will even deny that it exists. So we will talk about some of the cultural nuances, hopefully to help better assist you as you begin to represent members of the Caribbean in domestic violence cases. Now I will turn it over to Mark Joseph, who will talk about domestic violence, define what domestic violence is, and go into more details into the different types of injunctions. Mark? Thank you, Beatrice. Again, I'm Mark Joseph. And um, one of the things that we want to touch base on is essentially the legal side. Um, obviously, the focus here is representing the Caribbean families, so we want to start with where the law falls. So what is domestic violence? Um, domestic violence, it's listed there, it's, it's, it's defined as any assault, aggravated assault, battery, aggravated battery, sexual assault, sexual battery, stalking, which can include cyber stalking, false imprisonment, kidnapping, or any other criminal offense that results in a physical injury or death of one family or household member by another family or household household member. That's under chapter 741-28-2, okay? Now, this is the general aspect of what family law is. So there's two different ways we can deal with domestic violence. There is action, okay? What I've normally told, and it's the best way to kind of later when we talk about clients, the civil aspect of this, a civil injunction, is to protect. It's about the safety and protection. The whole idea is if there is no intervention, that the safety and harm of, of, of the person, of the client, the victim, or their family member is at risk, while the criminal is more focused on the punishment. It's the state of Florida, the prosecutors, they're prosecuting the actions. There is huge co confusion that comes there. So we're gonna go into the breakdown of the differences. In a criminal DV stay away order, one of the things that should be noted is that it's only effective only while the criminal case is pending. It's also automatically applied after the defendant is arrested and before they're, re um, they're released. So pretty much you have the incident occurs or what have you, at some point the police get involved and then they make a determination, they make an arrest. They have the special designation that it's a criminal DV. The person gets arrested or held before they go to first apparent, appearance, before they are released. As a condition of their release, there will be a stay away order put in place. Um, much of it operates similar to a injun civil injunction but it, it has its own it has its own focus. So in the stay away order, it does prohibit the defendant, keep in mind this is in criminal, so a defendant from being 500 feet away from the victim, the victim's home, place of employment or school and or school. And it has no distance pro prohibition from the victim's car. And it does not include children's issues because remember we're in criminal court. So conversely, when we start talking about the civil injunction, there are some changes. I'm focusing here on the slide that state attorneys and public defenders are not involved in the civil injunction. While in the criminal, 
you do deal with the, you know, it's the criminal system. So you have the state attorney and then you have the public defender or private counsel if the, um, if the person doesn't qualify for a PD. But in a civil injunction, an individual person, the, and it's not uh, the, 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 the plaintiff, it's a petitioner. So in, in, in use of representation, we would be, if you're representing the victim, that would be the petitioner. That petitioner can file the injunction on their own or can get help from counsel. But there is no court appointed counsel on either end. And then the defendant is the respondent. Many of these cases, about 80% of these cases do operate without any sort of parties, any sort of attorneys involved. So the defendant in these civil, I mean, the respondent in these the civil actions may not have contact with the petitioner at all. There is the inclusion of the 500 feet. However, it can include the, um, the, um, the victim's vehicle as well. And in the civil injunction, there are children issues that can be addressed. Typically speaking, if we're dealing with two married parties, there is a presumption in the state of Florida that the husband is the parent, um, is the uh, legal father of the children. So once those things come up, one of the first things that get addressed by the court is what are we going to do with the children? Um, typically, when the first injunction, the temporary injunction is granted, which is done after filing, after the court determines that there is um, enough cause to move forward and enter a temporary injunction for immediate protection, the courts may, cause, uh, may decide on zero time sharing for the other parent. Something that should be noted with that is the fact that if the children so happen to be with the respondent, the court may go as far as to enter that there be zero contact there. Because again, the focus on protection, the parenting issues and things like that does come second, but still can be addressed. Also, there's things like alimony and child support, which may also be addressed. These are some of the things that do not get addressed in the criminal action. So um, in a criminal case, it's entirely up to the prosecutor whether they want to um, prosecute that case. Just because they choose to or not to prosecute that case does not mean in the civil injunction that the, the petitioner, the victim, cannot move forward. So keep in mind, um, you know, in all intents and purposes and in experience and practice, if there is a pending criminal action, there is at least enough when you file a civil injunction that the courts tend to err on the side of caution and enter at least a temporary injunction. Doesn't mean a permanent one to be granted. However, even if the prosecutor chooses not to prosecute the injunction, I mean, the, the DV in criminal court does not mean that you could not, in fact, get a temporary or even permanent injunction in the civil court. So one does not beget the other. Um, typically, again, as a matter of practice, even if there's a criminal DV pending, I always tell, tell, um, tell clients, to still go forward with the civil injunction, even whether it's granted or not. So now, what are the different types of injunctions? Um, under the Florida um, the fa uh, Florida Family Law Rules of Procedure 12.610, it defines the type of injunction that can be, that, that can be um, received by the petitioner. There is the domestic violence injunction, which is the, I don't wanna say the standard, but that's the one typically people are familiar with. There's a sexual violence injunction. There is the dating violence injunction, repeat violence injunction, and the stalking injunction. Now, going into the jurisdictional standing and venue of the domestic violence, it tends to be defined within the criminal code of um, 741.30. And the standing and the qualifications to receive that is to basically be a family or household member. Now, this definition is interesting because you know family can can kind of operate in different dynamics. It could be, you know, obviously mother and father, it can be father and child, it can be mother and child, either way, or it can again be household members. So in theory, it can also address roommates and the like within household members. This also includes what would be considered ex uh, co-parenting family. So just because you have mom living in, in a house and dad lives in a different house, if they have children in common, that would still qualify within the domestic violence definition as stated here. The venue does not have a residential requirement, but the filing can happen where the victim temporarily resides or where the respondent resides 
or where the the, um, the violence occurs. It's just it's basically the run of the mill um, personal jurisdiction venue argument. It's you know the petitioner can kind of choose one of these three options as to where the filing does occur. However, keeping in mind where the evidence and the things would be, it's just it's essentially something straight out of Civ Pro. The ex parte injunction, which is the temporary injunction, we discussed it a bit before, does talk about the 500 feet from the home, 100 feet away from the car. It talks about not contacting that person at all, but also can address and award the exclusive use of the shared home if the facts allow for it. So if you do have a situation where the, your, your client, the petitioner victim, gets abused, leaves the home, filed the injunction and respondent still at the home, this injunction order can essentially order that the respondent would have to leave the house, well, for more specifically, the petitioner would have exclusive jurisdiction, which means the petition can actually go there with the police, with this injunction, ask the respondent to remove their things and leave while the petitioner maintains the home. You can obviously understand how this may benefit a lot of people who kind of operate in the fear of, you know, like, well, if I file this injunction and they're at the house, I can't leave. And this even counts, even if that house is owned by the respondent, whether you're in a divorce or let's say, she, you know, the victim lives with the lives with the respondent and the respondent owns the home, the court can still order the exclusive use of that shared home. It also requires a weapon surrender of the respondent, and well as the 100% time sharing of the petitioner. This gets a little bit complicated depending on whether the, the, the children are currently with the petitioner or the respondent, or if the parents are, um, the parties are married. But generally speaking, the petitioner does get awarded that 100% time sharing. And it only lasts for 15 days. The final relief does come from the final judgment, and it can and it can reiterate a lot of the provisions entered into the temporary injunction, and you know, and and it basically, when it, if it is granted in its permanence, statutorily, it's supposed to be until further order of the court. Now, sexual violence, a lot of the standards and standing is similar. It's standing and venue is similar. The ex parte relief. I'm sorry, I apologize. The standing is technically a person who is a victim of sexual violence or the parent of legal minor living at a home who is a victim of the sexual violence. The venue, does there is no minimum residential requirement, but similar to um, in the regular domestic violence injunction, it can be done where he or she temporarily resides, where the respondents lives or where the violence occurred. Now the standard to receive the ex parte release relief requires that the incident is reported to law enforcement and there is cooperation in any criminal proceeding against the respondent whether it's been filed or reduced or dismissed or that there was an um there was a sentencing for the sexual violence we required in a um um of imprisonment and that the imprisonment is expired or due to end within 90 days following following the filing of the petition so in other words if the person's incarcerated that um, and the person was a bit, um, in the victim who the petition in this case has still have that concern, she would file, he or she will file this petition within 90 days of that person's release. Dating violence, the standing is fairly, um, fairly clear. It's individuals who have had continuing and significant relationship of a romantic or intimate nature, must have existed within the last six months, and it would have to be characterized by the expectation or affection or sexual involvement. And the frequency and type of interaction must be included involvement over time on a continuous basis. You have to um, in, in, um, talk about the frequency and type of interaction. And just noting that even if there's a dispute of that, again, in my experience, um, the courts tend to err on the side of caution. Um, the courts definitely focus at least on the temporary aspect of it to making sure that there is protection and in addressing the final results thereafter. Now, that being said, the on again, off again aspect of it only changes the qualification of dating violence. Even if it is not there, it may not qualify for dating violence, but it may still qualify for a domestic violence injunction or even a sexual, um, a sexual violence injunction. These things can be alleged separate and apart, all as one or all these things can be alleged. It's just each of them have different standards to show. And if you're within that, you want to make sure that the standing is applied, that the venue is appropriate, um, so that you know 
that or all the relief can be retrieved. Um, the same thing similar to the ex parte relief of the other ones. It prohibits further acts of violence, no contact, 500 feet no contact order from the home and 100 feet away from the car and a weapon surrender, as well as that those same relief can be awarded in a final injunction. And then there's repeat violence in which there is no relationship to the offender or it is not required. And any party not including the definitions of other injunctions can qualify under this one. Same venue requirements and the relief that can be sought is similar to all the other ones. The, prevent, the prohibits the further acts, the 500 feet away from the home, 100 feet away from the car. So all, these, all, all the reliefs inevitably, the relief stays the same, it's the standing and the standard that changes a bit. And finally, we have the stalking and um, stalking violence, that there's no relationship to the offender required. And more specifically with the ex parte relief and the final relief in this one, it's that the, res the respondent is restrained from committing any acts of stalking. There are definitely times if the allegations show the ways that they've, they've stalked the party, it usually lays it out within that injunction, the temporary and permanent, but then the courts can also go outside the box and address any other ones just to prevent people from kind of just jumping in thereafter. As it relates, as it relates to the relief, it's the same thing. And the court in this case can also refer the petitioner to appropriate services and order the respondent to participate in treatment intervention or counseling services to be paid by them specifically. Essentially, when we're addressing a lot of these issues, one thing to keep in mind that a history of the parties and as they've been involved with each other is so important because while one, the, you know, while the petitioner can come in for a DV injunction, this facts may not apply for a DV. It may be more appropriate for a stalking or, or for a sexual violence. And then you have cases where the party just has fear, but there had been no physical acts or even threats of physical acts, but it looks more like it's, been, it's a stalking issue. So these are the things that we want to be very careful about. We definitely want to make sure that we have the statutes, the statutes are there on the PowerPoints, that we have an idea of what the statutes qualify as, and that gets it going. And that's at least, that's at least a general breakdown of the laws and the standards that we will be up against when we're addressing the various forms of domestic violence cases. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Beatrice. Uh, for providing that very important information. And there was a lot of good information that was provided regarding the statistics of what's going on in our community when it comes to uh, domestic violence. One of the very important issues that I think that we have to uh, take a look at is the fact that when we're doing a case assessment, um, with all domestic violence uh, victims, they will likely be reluctant to even um, bring up the domestic violence. They may be nervous about talking about it, uh, but it's important to do the best that you can to make that person as comfortable as possible. There are gonna be a few things you're gonna be looking at. Um, part of it is, like Mark said, you look at the statute, right? Not every single um, act of violence may fall into one particular category, but when you're doing a case assessment, you have to make sure uh, that you are reviewing the facts that are presented to you asking the right questions to make sure that the domestic violence injunction or the petition rather has the appropriate language to provide the relief. So what Mark mentioned is that the temporary injunctions are good for 15 days. Can that be extended? Of course, you go to court, you request additional time to prepare, you may wanna subpoena, you may wanna do these things, but you wanna make sure that when you start the case and you start the process, you cite the proper, um, you cite the proper um, statute you're going under, whether it's gonna be domestic violence. You don't want for you to say that there was dating violence and there wasn't dating. You understand that? And these are small things that um, you may not realize, um, but it's not worth it for your client to lose um, in that particular category because uh, us, the, the legal language is not provided within the case. So you listen to the person, bring in the facts, just like any other case, and you have the statute present to see whether or not you're gonna be asking under the domestic violence mm -hmm. one, the um, stalking, the, I know Mark listed like a whole bunch of them, right? <laughs> 
uh, the domestic violence, the sexual violence, the dating violence, the repeat violence, or the stalking. Um, they all have a specific burden of proof. The burden of proof is going to be on the person um, that is alleging that the abuse took, took place. And just because you're not provided a temporary immediate injunction, when you do have that hearing within 15 days or whenever you extend, whenever you request for an extension and hopefully they provide you with that extension, um, you can get a temporary injunction denied, but the courts are required to give you a hearing date. And you have the choice when you're filling out the paperwork to say, even if the court believes that I did not make a prima facie case on the domestic violence, I would like to go forward. And the reason that's important is sometimes when someone is that afraid, they will go to the courthouse themselves, they'll fill out the paperwork and they'll do it um, incorrectly. And then once they do it incorrectly, they're like, I need help. Let me go to an attorney. Let me go to the guardian and Leiden program. Let me do something because I really am afraid for my life. So just because they did not say what they needed to say properly, or sometimes they're too embarrassed to say what they really need to say um, because they're writing it down or someone's helping them write it down and they don't have the gumption to say this took place, that took place, that took place, and that took place. Because rarely is it just one instance because there's that level of shame that someone may go through because you're you're having the other person write it down when you're writing down and you're telling yourself, why did I stay in this relationship so long? Why didn't, do, why didn't I do something sooner? And so instead of one extreme where people exaggerate too much and they can't substantiate their claims, there are the other ones that said, well, he said some mean things to me or, you know, he said he's gonna kick me out of the house. He said he's gonna, he or she, excuse me, let me be gender neutral here. Um, he or she's gonna kick me out of the house. He or she's gonna do certain things to me. And without the proper language, you may not trigger to the judge who's going to be reading these and reading dozens in a day, whether or not your client's case rises to that level. So make sure the paperwork does demonstrate that even if it isn't granted, um, excuse me, even if it isn't granted by the court for an immediate temporary injunction, you do want to go forward to present your case and explain that to your client if that does take place. And I don't know that res judicata uh, applies here, but if someone is really afraid for their lives, you can still try again. Um, to to do that as long as they presented their case and they presented the facts um, that are there. I think that part is it, and I think we're ready to go to the next section now. All right, so now we're going to talk about the cultural significances and the cultural nuances that happen within a culture um, that sometimes if you're not part of the culture, you're not going to recognize it, you're not going to see it, and you're, it's going to go past you, and you're not going to understand why certain things take place. Uh, some there is shame and there's stigma in domestic violence all over the world, whether it has to be, whether it's a Caribbean community uh, or non-Caribbean community, there is almost always shame and embarrassment that's associated with um, domestic violence. Um, and that can come from your family, that can come from your friends, and that can come from neighbors. When it comes from your family and friends, a lot of times the aggressor will do what they normally do, which is alienate you from your support system. If you don't have a friend, if you don't have a family, if you don't have someone that you can go to, then that means that you're gonna stay in, your, in this situation longer and you won't have that there. So they're going to create situations and cause that person to alienate all their friends. So you may be, again, taking down the information from the person who's giving you this information, and you're wondering, like, didn't you have family? Didn't you have friends? No, they find a way to um, separate themselves from everyone else. And then the next circle that you have beyond family and beyond friends are your neighbors. And if something does happen and you do call the cops, now you're looking at the police sirens blazing coming into your neighborhood. And if it happened multiple times, you don't want to be that neighbor. So that may prevent someone from after repeated instances of domestic violence. One of the questions that I know as an attorney that I always ask is, well, why didn't you call the cops? Well, what about this time and this time and this time? And sometimes the shame and the questions that comes afterwards, because if your neighbors ask you, hey, what happened? And you happen to tell them or they saw the abuser being taken away in handcuffs, you let them know what happens, the neighbor will then ask, well, or will look at you if you decide to reconcile with this person and now you're living back in the same house. Mm -hmm. And abuse happens in different ways. Now, for example, there, there's a physical abuse that Mark mentioned and the sexual abuse and even the stalking and harassment, but abuse um, normally takes place in several multitudes. And, and one of those issues may be financial control, right? So. I need this person to come back because I can't afford to pay the mortgage or the rent. I believe that I'm going to be kicked out of the house. There's so many instances that happen, but everything is wrapped up around the shame because they had a choice if, to the rational world, uh, outside world. Everyone is looking at them like you had the choice to leave and you chose not to leave. Uh, there's the machismo on the other side 
where Ms. Kazo Beatrice mentioned how um, a certain percentage, I wrote it down, but my notes are all over the place right now, sort of a certain percentage of men um, experience um, intimate partner violence. And Beatrice, can you, do you have those numbers again? Um, how many men in South Florida? In South Florida, it is 29.3% um, of men. 30% approximately, almost 30% of the uh, people that are being abused by their partner are men, and these are the ones that I believe are reported. Uh, so you're looking at a large majority of people who have shame wrapped around for a multitude of reasons. And if they're ashamed uh, from their friends, uh, their family and their friends and their neighbor, you are essentially a stranger to them. If I can't tell my best friend, if I can't tell my sister or my brother what's going on, what makes it easier to go ahead and tell someone uh, who's in front of me? So what ends up happening is as uh, when a client comes to me practicing family law, they start with one story and it's not uncommon for that story to evolve and evolve and evolve. And you have to make the uh, determination whether or not that person is now lying to you or whether that person was too embarrassed to tell you the full truth. So there's gonna be some um, uh, trust building that's gonna happen and it won't be uncommon that the story will change and it will evolve. And even if it changes and evolves, they may still be telling you the truth. You may be just getting a, a, an additional layer of trust if you get a different story. It's like an onion being peeled back because a lot of these things, a lot of the times this happens. Um, another thing that happens with shame and embarrassment is when it comes to the, to the cycle of domestic violence, if you know your partner is prone to bouts of violence, sometimes the person that is being abused will aggravate. They will poke at the situation because the tension is too hard. They know they're gonna get hit again. They know something violent is happening. So they will do something wild, obnoxious. They will, they will trigger the other partner to now abuse them so they can finally get it over with. And then they have, there's that shame and embarrassment that also comes with that, but it's also a cycle as well. If I can control when the beating is coming, it's not as bad as when it comes out of nowhere. So that also happens as well. The next thing that I think is important to mention in our community is a general mistrust of the police. You go to different countries around the Caribbean and you can pay off the police. And I'm not saying that it doesn't happen here. Um, and maybe we're just better at hiding it, but it is rampant. It is one of those things where sometimes your own client will believe that um, the other person who is the financial, the more financial, um, wealthy party would have paid you. So when you're being um, critical of their case and you're being critical because you wanna make sure that if I go to court, I'm gonna win and the other side is gonna ask you, so I need this information. And when you start getting critical and you start digging down into the details, they're looking at you like, were you paid off? Was the police paid off? Well, he or she wasn't arrested and they didn't believe me and they feel like the system is against them. So that's one of the things that I think is important to understand that, that part of the reason they may have not called the police is that they don't believe the police is, by their, is, is on their side. Um, and another part, another reason why they may not call the police is um, authority figures may be bought off because you know we generally have uh, a corrupt system. So that may be an issue or nuance that you may wanna pay attention to when you're dealing with uh, cases of domestic violence within the Caribbean community. Now, Mark made an excellent point regarding the differences between a civil injunction and a criminal injunction. When it comes to a civil injunction within the family realm, um, the court can address things such as child support and alimony within the case. All, of, all, all cases are different, but the criminal aspects of it. So that means that the person is arrested. They're outside of the home now. The person now feels like there's a level of security. And sometimes what happens is, well, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and deal with the criminal side. I don't need this uh, family law injunction because at least the person is outside of the home and I, I'm no longer afraid that the person is not gonna hurt me and harm me. So they may decide not to pursue a domestic violence injunction, not knowing that they can receive support that they essentially need. Because again, one of the ways that uh, an abuser can control you is through financial control. So if they cannot financially control you anymore, then guess what? Now you have that freedom to now speak and now pursue different avenues, including um, getting a criminal injunction and a, um, a family law injunction. Now, uh, one of the biggest uh, obstacles that you're gonna have is a lack of knowledge of the court system. Uh, I remember when I was, uh, I went to court for the first time, I, I'm pretty sure I threw up on the way to and on the way out. And as an attorney being prepared, uh, learning the laws, studying and being, uh, doing everything you can to make sure that you present a good case in front of the court, as an attorney, if you can get nervous, um, you can only imagine how nervous a person will get um, 
by not knowing and not understanding and understanding the court system. So we as attorneys, we have the um, problem of always speaking in legalese. Um, and that could be intimidating to someone. Another way that a person gets abused is verbal abuse. And that verbal abuse by itself um, isn't enough for an injunction unless they're saying that I'm gonna kill you and, and they threaten your life. Um, but when it comes to uh, when it comes to verbal abuse, they're told that they're stupid and they're dumb and they don't know these things. So they may be afraid to tell you, I don't understand what you mean by or a tennis motion that you're going to say in front of the court. And they're not going to ask you and they're not going to understand. And so it's better to over-educate. And they're like, oh, okay, yes, I know that. Or no, I didn't know that. And sometimes when you just explain things a little bit more, they'll come to you or they'll the volunteer, oh, I didn't know what that was, but I was too embarrassed to ask you, right? Because they want to feel, they want to appear smart in front of you and say, hey, I can do this because I am taking the next steps um, to work on my case. So they won't tell you that they do not understand certain parts of the court system. So it's it's up to you to explain it like a third grader. When I go to the doctor for my mom, I'm like, listen, explain it to me like I'm two years old. I'm not going to pretend because I'm a lawyer and I'm supposed to be smart that I know and understand what you're saying. I don't explain it to me like I'm five, and I don't have a problem saying that to someone, but your client may be too afraid to tell you that they don't understand. So there are certain rights and responsibilities that they have. Sometimes there are dual, um, and they're not meant to be dual. There has to be two separate injunctions, but people need to know what their rights are and what their responsibilities are. Um, so those are some of the things that you have to make sure that you um, explain. And I think, Mark, you wanted to make a point about the difference between what an impassioned conversation is and what domestic violence is. Yes. Yeah, so um, the, um, thank you for all that information, Brittany. Um, when you talk about the difference between the, you know, what's domestic violence for purposes of getting an injunction in the impassioned conversation. Um, it's easy to be said that, uh, you know, a lot of different groups, you know, there, there's enough of intense arguing a situation but there is a nuance within a lot of the cultures of the um, Caribbean diaspora, where there's a lot of impassioned conversation to say the least. Um, but there is a sharp designation between just getting voice, having discussions and having intense dialogue versus what domestic violence looks like. And one of the things very clear and very, very much worth noting is once someone's harm to themselves, to, to their person, any potentials, any statements that can be led to believe that this person is intending to harm that person at that time or later on is where domestic violence comes in. And, um, you know, sometimes you'll look at some of these injunctions and you look at the allegations or, you know, your client will come in with the facts. And sometimes you want to dig into that. Um, it's not as simple to say, well, he yelled at me and he screamed and argued. You, you kind of also have to take in consideration within the history of the relationship and if there was conversations that happened similar to that or did it go to the next level. And um, Fritzy made a bunch of points about how you communicate and people being embarrassed and feeling like they don't want to act like they don't know what's going on. It, it's very important to take a very cautioned approach when, 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 when seeking this information from, any, from, from the client. Um, you definitely, you know, when you say, hey, you know, did you call the police? You don't want to say that. You just say, hey, were the police called? Did anybody come out? You know, you don't want to say, you don't want to kind of ask it in a question that may be perceived as kind of interrogating. Um, one of the things that you, you got to be very careful when you address victims in that specific way. And it's a very simple question, very direct question. However, you want to be cautious because you want them to feel like every, all the information you're giving, um, that, that you're giving and they're getting, it, it comes from a place of protection. But in separating out what the impassioned conversation is versus domestic violence, you need to ask, okay, do you remember the conversation? Um, what exactly what was said? What started the conversation? How did we get here? At what point did you feel like you needed to be scared or, or you felt concerned? These are things that are important because at the end of the day, this all falls into the standard that, the, the, that, that they must show to the court. So, um, you know, the way you ask these questions, the way you dig it out would separate out whether or not you, you will have a su successful injunction hearing or it's something that may be kicked out because the testimony wasn't where we wanted it to be. Now, one of the other things that I believe I learned very early on um, is a very specific cultural mannerisms 
uh, that can negatively impact specifically Haitian communities. Um, a sign of respect is not looking someone in the eye, right? As a child, you are taught when an adult or an authority figure is speaking to you, you look at the ground, okay? And the courts are taught, and one of the things that they, they have to determine um, when regarding a person's credibility are things like the person had shifty eyes or they look a different way or they hesitated or they stuttered or they couldn't look a person directly in the eye. Now, in an American society, a sign of respect, a sign of directness and a sign of a person being very genuine is a person looking you in the eye. With Haitians in particular, it's a sign of disrespect to actually stare at someone in the eye. And I believe that our courts um, now more than ever are being taught the differences between um, different cultural mannerisms and someone not looking a person in the eye could not necessarily um, demonstrate shame. It could just mean a sign of respect. So uh, it's important for um, someone to make sure that they talk to them and practice to say, well, where are you gonna be looking? And you know, it's important to look this way or that way um, to make sure that the court can hear you and or understand you. Um, that way you're not necessarily um, being combative towards their particular, uh, or disrespectful towards their um, particular mannerism, but it's important for you to know because if you don't know this and you go to court and you're like, look up, and you have to now get over that person's objection with looking up and explaining, it's a bit problematic and you may um, lose your chance of demonstrating to the court that your client is being genuine and that your client is telling the truth. Now, again, our courts have been, um, they've been trained um, and given sensitivity training, but you have new judges on the bench. Uh, you sometimes, you know, it's been a while uh, and they may not remember that this may be a particular nuance. So if you can address it with your client um, before it becomes an issue, I think it's important to, to see how they would interact in a court setting, okay? Um, and one of the other things that uh, Mark definitely pointed out it's the fact that a, a family law injunction can give you something called exclusive possession of the home. So a lot of people are afraid to physically leave. Part of me not having money to now rent a place or rent a place for me and my children um, then becomes problematic. So people tend to believe that if they, and this is if they're married, but if they leave, they lose access to the home. And that's not true. Whether you have a lease or if you're not on the lease, or whatever the case may be, there are legal, there's, there's, there are very strong protections for people who live in the same home as someone else. You don't necessarily have to be on the lease um, for someone not be able to go and change the locks. And that happens sometimes. You know what? If you leave, you can never come back. Unfortunately, not true in our society. <laughs> you can leave for a few days and you can come back. And if the person changed the locks, you get to call the cops as long as you can prove that you would stay there before to get that to happen. So sometimes, um, leaving to get away from the abuse is not an option for them because they believe that they can't come back to the home or that they lost all rights to the home. So I think that's very important to let them know that if they do want to stay with a family friend, if they just don't want to be around, um, that's one of the that's one of the ways that they can um, protect themselves. Not to mention with technology nowadays, um, someone who's being abused and stalked and or stalked, um, they have trackings inside the home, they have cameras inside the home, and it's not uncommon for someone to come to me and say, I'm not comfortable there. Can I go somewhere and still not lose access to my home in some later, um, at some later point in time? And you can feel comfortable saying, yes, you can do that because the number one um, concern is could is could should be to protecting that person um, to make sure that this type of abuse doesn't take place anymore. Brittany, I wanted to add, because you and Mark have made several um, points, but I wanted to go back in terms of the cultural nuances. We know that in the Haitian community, um, the worst thing you can ever do to a, a man or a family member is to call the cops on them. And, you know, you will have the entire family, his mama, his, his sisters and brothers coming after you. And so when the victim tells you that they are in fear, they really are, and the fear is real, at least for them, it's real. The other aspect that we talked about is sexual assault. Now, I will tell you, you will find very few um, Haitian American or you know people of um, from the Caribbean who will go forward in terms of domestic violence as it as it relates to sexual battery, only because um, it's not really something that they even consider. 
I had a case where, um, you know, we were um, filing for divorce. These two parties have not been together intimately for months, if not years, if I can recall. And then just one night, the husband went into the, the marital bedroom and basically forced himself on her. And she wouldn't even talk about it. So she didn't even perceive it as sexual assault, even though she never invited it. She was not, she didn't want it, but it wasn't until we started talking that she says, this is what he did. And she could not even identify it as sexual assault because it's not part of her vocabulary because for a lot of people, um, they believe that, you know, they owe it to their husbands. There is part of their, um, likely duties, you know, basically to have sexual relations with their partners. And even though we are in the process of filing for divorce, she saw, still saw him as, his, as her husband. So that's another thing when we're talking about cultural nuances, because some of it is not part of their vocabulary. So they may not even raise that issue, you know, to you as their attorneys. And we talked about um, language barriers. Again, um, first, we talk about being embarrassed. The whole issue of sex and, you know, sexual intimacy with your partners, it's not something that they will volunteer. You understand to you, they're, they're embarrassed to talk. And I'm talking about grown men and women. It's not something that because it's part of their culture, this is not something that we talk about publicly. It's not for public consumption, what we do in our bedrooms with our partners. And so these are things that, you know, if, if not, as we're talking about when was the last time you have sexual relations with your partner, when was the last time you were intimate, if something like that may come up, at which point you know that she's embarrassed. This is not something that she wanted. These parties have been separated for so long. So he forced himself on her and she, you know, still was not uh, um, able to, to talk about it. So again, it goes back to, you know, when you're doing, when you're preparing your client, for, for your um, domestic violence hearings is how you ask the questions. Again, um, they don't trust the police, they don't trust the legal system because they're, they don't know how it works. And so it is your job or our job as, as attorneys, you know, to prepare our clients to try to pull the information out of them, the information that we need to be able to prove the case. And, um, Fritzny talked about the fact that in a lot of these households, the father, the, the man is the primary breadwinner. So we have situations where once he is kicked out of the house in the stay away order, some of them, not, not all of them, but many of these men refuse to take care of the household. They will not pay for you know, the mortgage. They will no longer pay for the rent. They won't do any of that unless they have access to the woman, which is your client, which is the victim. You understand? They may not, unless the court ordered them to pay child support as part of the temporary restraining order, they may not even give money to her for um, the kids. So therefore, yes, there is that aspect. There, there's the economic aspect of it. And you can see that you're working on a case and then the victim changed her mind. You understand? And you don't understand why, because there's a clear case of domestic violence. That's because he got to her mother or he got to her sister or, you know, have some, even though there should not be any third party contact, but trust me, he, there's ways for him to get the message to her that he's not paying for anything in that house because he, he doesn't live there because she called the cops on him because, you know, she called, she, she brought him to, to the legal justice system. So it, the, the fear is real. Uh, it is Beatrice. And thank you so much for bringing it to everyone's attention that um, it may not seem as difficult to handle these cases, but it really can be. Now we're looking, one of the things that I wanted to bring everyone's attention to is the fact that there are times that someone will use a domestic violence injunction to gain leverage when it comes to um when it comes to file when it comes to their separate paternity action when it comes to their divorce action um and whether or not you're on the other side where you have um the party that is being accused of domestic violence and you're saying it's not true it's not true it's not true and now you have the burden of demonstrating that well one of the things that they will use it against the other partner for or party for is um leverage um 
I can't, the only way you can kick someone out of a marital home um, is through a domestic violence injunction, right? Um, when I do divorces or paternity action, they're like, I want the exclusive use of the marital home. And when you look at the case law, the case law says someone has to be in fear of their life. It is not, I don't like him. I don't like her. She keeps screaming at me. She yells at me. She embarrasses me in front of the kids. There's none of that. Okay. She's disrespecting me or she just, they're bringing another person to the household. You know, they're cheating. None of that is relevant. The way you get someone out of the home is if there is violence or a threat of violence. So how do you work around it? You allege there's some domestic violence, whether it's true or not. If the allegations are strong enough, you have an automatic 15 day um, temporary injunction that will, that at the 15th day, it'll be heard or um, it'll be extended for another date that it will be heard. And these things can go on for a very long period of time. Another um, item that you, that may be brought up, remember how I mentioned, you know, sometimes they don't understand the court system and they don't know how to tell you they don't understand because their entire relationship, they have been told repeatedly that they are dumb and they are stupid. Well, some of these people may be illiterate and it may be hard for you to understand that they are illiterate, right? They may come with someone, they may come with a friend that'll fill out the paperwork for them. Or they say, you know what, I just want to talk to you about it. I don't, I want to write these things down. Um, and for you to get to the point where you do know a person doesn't understand what they're signing because you have, I mean, I'm pretty sure some of you guys have done some civil litigation and someone will not admit in the beginning, well, I can't read, so I didn't read the contract, right? They'll just say, I didn't read it, I just signed it. Not that even if I had the option to read it, I couldn't read it. So you're looking at people, some people that may be illiterate, but maybe too embarrassed to tell you that they do not understand um, the any paperwork that you may be giving them. So that's something that you may want to be conscious of, right? Um, so things like, can you do me a favor? Can you write something in your own words? Don't do it here as in let them be the one to tell you later on because they might not, they might feel confronted by it to say, Hey, you know what? This is going to be a lot for you. Right. Um, so I want you to take some time um, on your own to just write down what happened. Uh, and then we can go over these things to just see if they are literate and they can understand, um, whatever documents or papers that they may be signing. Um, Beatrice started off with, um, her going uh, to a church and the sermon, the sermon um, stating that domestic violence. What, what, what did the uh, the pastor said to you, or said to the congregation rather, that domestic that, violence um, that they cannot. There, the Lord does not like divorces, and even if the husband is beating them, <laughs> essentially that they cannot file. They cannot file for divorce, even in an abusive relationship. And so I think it's important to respect a person's culture. Not that I think that that's what the Bible said. However, respect a person's culture, right? That is one of the, the first things that they are taught um, is to identify with a particular religion. And once they are committed to that religion, it's going to be hard to separate, uh, separate them from that. And you don't have to separate from that. Um, a uh, domestic violence injunction is not asking for a divorce. It's a complete separate, it has its own case number. It's completely different. There are people that come to me that says, listen, I'm Seventh Day Adventist. I will never get divorced, but we need to separate. I will live apart, but I will never divorce my, my spouse, whether it's my husband or my wife. And I've had that happen on multiple occasions. So within the domestic violence inju injunction or action, they can get a domestic violence injunction and remain ma married for as long as they too decide to remain married. Right. So you can still respect a person's religion and allow them to um, and allow them to um, continue practicing that religion, not just respect that religion and still protect themselves and their children from the situation, because that's their job to do is to protect themselves um, and, and do that as well. And the last two things that we wanted to um, discuss is a language barrier. And yes, when you have a different culture, it is. Um, it's almost a given that there will be some sort of language barriers. Um, they tend to come with someone else in the room to help them translate. Then you're going to have to deal with whether or not you're violating attorney-client pr privilege, whether or not they're too embarrassed to say this in front of the trusted family or friend, because people tell me, hey, I trust this person. It's quite a right. I'll say anything in front of them, and you can say anything in front of them. And then you start mentioning sex when you're doing a little checklist, and they freeze up or they don't want to talk or later on when they're not with that person, they're going to tell you that more things happen, but they obviously didn't want to mention that with the other person in the room. So it's important for you guys to read body language to see whether or not they're too embarrassed to say it. Fritz, if you can um, go quickly over the immigration issues as it relates to um, immigration, I mean, domestic violence victims. 
so that we can take questions. Absolutely. Um, victims of domestic violence, whether you're a man or woman, we're definitely gender neutral here. Um, if you don't have papers, and that's again, another power system. If you don't have papers, if you don't have documentation, if a person is a citizen, maybe even a permanent resident, but definitely a citizen, um, and that person um, abused you, uh, then you can get, you can self petition to get legal documentation to, to take your status um, as out of status, as the in status, and you can use the fact that you were abused. They don't, there's a there's a form that's involved. There's interview questions involved. There's a lot of practices in place that immigration does to kind of protect that person and protect that person's family members, um, whether they have children with that person. But if you are abused, uh, immigration in the U.S. doesn't tolerate that, and they will not allow that person to use that as a mechanism of power over you. So there are avenues to do so. And there are sometimes it's the alternative where people say, hey, I don't want to call the police because I don't want them deported because if they're deported, they're not paying child support and I need someone to help me with that. And so it's a two-way street when it comes to immigration consequences. That's my two seconds because I know we have questions and I don't want to monopolize everyone's time. Thank you. I saw some questions. I think the first one was from Mark. How many incidents are required to establish repeat violence? The minimum is at least two times. That's the minimum to establish repeat violence. The standard is fairly low on that. And again, it tends to mirror some of the other ones, but um, the main focus to qualify for that one is Two, um, two or more instances of some sort of violence. We have a resource on there. I believe that there's a PDF um, where it has the uh, resource. So if anybody wants to um, get the information about the program, you can go ahead and press the link as well. I see one that says, is it common that a respondent kills a petitioner in violation of a previously issued stay away injunction? Um, I mean, it, it's, Honestly, it very much happens. Common, that, that's a separate question, but it's something that does happen. And despite the fact that we're, we're here, we're gonna try our best to represent our parties, at the end of the day, whether it be a temporary permanent injunction, it's just a piece of paper. That's it. I mean, one, one of the biggest things I tell all of my clients is that if you truly, truly fear for your life and you feel like this person, whether he said it or you feel it, um, self-defense is the most important factor of trying to get as far away from that person as possible which limiting in contact and such, because that piece of paper will only help uh, help you so far. So um, it's a very real thing. It's a very understanding thing. But at the end of the day, there's only so much of it that's in our control. Exactly. Part of my conversations with my clients as well, I usually tell them that it's an important first step. Um, you know, if there's not basically a, a pending criminal case, if it's um, just an injunction, I will tell them that we can get an injunction. What it will do is protect you in some ways, in the sense that if he violates it, then now it can become a criminal case. We can refer that to the state attorney's office for a prosecution. However, again, it's just a piece of paper. Um, it's supposed to protect you, but it does not, it cannot save you from a bullet. So it, it, it is true. Now it says, this may be off topic, but if the petitioner is successful in getting a permanent civil injunction, can they have the respondent pay attorney's fees? Mark, I'll direct that to you. <laughs> um, to be honest, it, it's been something that's heavily contested, but to be completely frank, um, if the injunction is granted, attorney's fees isn't acknowledged. There's only one example that's come up in recent years as to when fees can be taken, and it's under the 57105 statute and it's basically the sanctionable conduct for essentially um you know the anything that falls within there fraudulent actions completely false um false cases that's the um case law that um addresses the 57105 but typically speaking um the filing of an injunction is free the representation although isn't free there's resources in the community to assist with that but there is no automatic there is no award of fees just based on the granting of domestic violence that statute tends to try to stay as far away from addressing attorney's fees as possible to avoid any issues of power dynamic. Mm -hmm. All right, and I see another question here. How do we work with individuals who have children who have been exposed to domestic violence and the parents continue to deny domestic violence and dependency is involved? I can jump on that. I think that um, for the most part, the way you, you frame it to them is the fact that they can actually lose custody of the children if they allow this person to come back in the home. Um, because we have situations where um, there's domestic violence in, in the house and um, there's a case pending. And um, again, with the whole factor 
that um, this person may not continue to pay the bills because of the pending case, because they're not able to access the home, they're not able to access the woman, they're not able to access the children, and you know they will not contribute financially. And so, yes, what you have to tell your client is that um, he may be the one who committed the act, but if you um, if you violate the judge's order and allow him back in the house while there's a stay away order, you can actually lose custody. So, and I think that sometimes it, it you know, make sure that they're, they do what needs to be done. Yeah. And, you and want to add anything, Mark? Yeah, and it's, it's important to note, when you have DCF independent, um, the, the DCF involved, um, one of the things that they do look at is the all around overarching circumstances. And, and, and one thing that they're not going to go as far as to do is to try to criminalize and antagonize victims. But it is very important for victims to understand what they should or shouldn't be doing in those circumstances. So it's very important to note that, you know, the children that witnessed the domestic violence kind of acknowledging it. Um, and, and the safety concerns of the children is there and paramount and going with what Pe Beatrice had um, mentioned, there is an obligation for the other parent to protect that child. Um, and, and it could be from the physical or it can be from the um, seeing of the violence. So it's very sensitive. Um, I usually suggest to most parties to follow the recommendation of the DCF worker. They're the ones writing the reports. They're the ones as much involved to kind of follow those suggestions as well. Yes, and a, and a child witnessing a domestic violence act, that right there is considered child abuse. Now, did you ask to get beaten by your partner? No, they're not saying that. That's not what they criminalize. They don't criminalize that because it can happen to almost anyone or it can happen to anyone, not almost anyone. It can happen to anyone. If it happens that one time, and if it happens a second time and he or she is doing it in the presence of the minor children, by you not removing you and your children away from that situation, you are knowingly, you may, you don't have an obligation necessarily to protect yourself as a person being abused. You have the absolute obligation to protect the children that are witnessing it. So it is considered an act of child abuse. And that's why DCF does get involved. And that's why the person who is getting abused may feel victimized even further to say, now they're going after me. Um, another question that we have is, what's the best way to handle a domestic violence case where someone, so that some person may not be a citizen? You get an immigration attorney involved, and it looks like, Mark, you wanted to, to discuss that a little bit further. Go right ahead. No, 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 you can touch it. You're, you're, you're the dual practice, immigration and family law, so I'm, I'll let you touch that. I'll jump on it, you know, if there's anything to add. Well, there is the Violence Against Women Act, and it's not it's not singled out to women. It, it, if the person is a woman or a man, it also protects that person's ch um, child or children as well. And that is something that they can try and do um, to get legal status. And that's a separate action and you're filing it with um, immigration. You're not necessarily filing it with the court, but it's not uncommon that someone is afraid that, you know what, I may be living here with my spouse and he or she may be abusing me, but it's better going back to my country where I really know I'm going to die. Right. So sometimes people are not concerned about getting papers. They're concerned about not getting deported as a result of it. OK. And unfortunately, someone can't deport someone else the same way, uh, like Mark was mentioning, um, the state attorney is going to be the one to make the decision to prosecute a case. When it comes to immigration, um, they are the ones that have the discretion um, to actually take a prior deportation order if you already have one or um, if they're going to pursue someone in particular to say, I'm going to take you and try and deport you. But it's pretty hard and people are pretty busy. Immigration is pretty busy um, deporting um, uh, people that are of higher, they're higher on the list. And so little old me, you're concerned about me and me getting papers. Usually the fact that you file a VAWA, a Violence Against Women Protection Act, will stay the case a little bit. But this is not something that you want to do on your own. You want to find an immigration attorney to help that person to take that one that other burden off of their shoulder. But go ahead, Mark. Um, and and, I'll, and I'd also note that that's the general fear that some people feel like they're not citizens and filing into the court system kind of subjects them into the court system in which, you know, the um, you know immigration will find out and make this an issue. Um, I mean, I can't say that it's not public record and I, I can't speak on what they do to search and or look for people. But what I will say is filing it in and of itself does not subject you to it. You don't somehow have your rights limited to the court intervention of a civil injunction because of your status. 
So, um, you know, in terms of balancing that, they would have to definitely try to consult with the uh, immigration professional on how to navigate that if their status is in limbo or, or is invalid. So um, that's something they got to look at. So um, you definitely want to, in client consideration, look at that and, and, and get one of those and get, get that into consideration because that may create the fear and apprehension that they have. And you want to knowingly, um, you know, advise them on, on their options as it relates to it. And on the flip side, we can say that if they're representing the person who's accused, then they really need to talk to a um, an immigration attorney because you know that may be, become an issue for if that person has a permanent injunction or if that person has a criminal domestic violence um, conviction or um, what have you, then that may become an issue. Okay. Now we have another question here. It says, "Can we stop saying it's just a piece of paper?" It does a disservice to the client and promotes the idea that injunctions are not helpful. They are helpful and provide protection because it immediately prioritizes a call to number one law enforcement officers. Otherwise, they will get there when they get around to it. Um, I don't think that we're trying to say that it's just a piece of paper. Um, I we, think we were answering a question that says the part about being killed. Is that correct? Yes. Um, yeah. with, the, with, with the injunction. And it yeah. is correct. Even with an injunction, the person can still find your victim and kill them. It, it happens. And, and, and one thing that has to be noted is, I mean, we, we talked about a bit the trust of the police and the like. You know, when you have this injunction, functionally speaking, you have this piece of paper. If this person comes near you, you can call the police, say there's a pending injunction that they're in violation of it. The police still has to come over, still has to see the person there has to take him or somehow prosecute it. Then the state attorney has to move forward and continue with the charges, even if they can prove the contact. At minimum, it takes having the police come there to stop and prevent the person. And, and when, so when we say that it's just a piece of paper, we're not saying it to undermine the process. Obviously we experience it here. We all practice domestic violence. The issue is when people truly, truly fear for their lives and the person, the respondent's actions is something where they're not just understanding that this piece of paper, they really want to commit harm. This piece of paper is not enough. If the person is coming to you and saying, I'm back to finish what I started, holding a piece of paper in front of them will not prevent that. So inevitably, we do want to make sure we're instructing the clients that at some point, you do have rights, you do have self-defense arguments, you do have the position that if someone comes into your person, you have that substantial fear, which will be verified by a domestic violence injunction, the same piece of paper, you have a right to protect yourself and your family by any means necessary. So we want to make sure that, you know, there is an empowerment aspect to that. The people need to understand you need to have pepper spray. You need to have some sort of protection. If it gets to that point, you have that fear, you need to be prepared for the real circumstance that if someone wants to commit harm, you have to be prepared to defend yourself or else. Yeah. This can we just add, which we didn't say, um, one of the most, um, what is it? The, the most dangerous, the most risky part of domestic violence is when the victim is trying to leave the relationship. That because once this person is losing, realizes that he or she is losing control, because remember, domestic violence is all about control, trying to control the other person. Once this person realizes that he or she is losing control of the victim, then this is when they become most violent. So yes, what we're saying, and, and you know, we apologize if it comes across as we're, you know, we're trying to minimize getting out an, an injunction against your abuser. But what we are saying is it, the paper, the domestic, the injunction alone is not going to protect you if this person is hell bent on killing you. And, and that's all we're saying. And and so what I think. We're trying to say is that it's one of the line, lines of defense. Um, if you need more, get more, but at a minimum, get the domestic violence injunction, get the criminal injunction, get the domestic violence injunction, do some self-defense. It's it's a combination. More in, in situations like this, more is better. 
and and and, and, th and thank and thank God and thank goodness the fact that sometimes this peace pyramid this injunction does steady people and push them away from wanting to commit that next level action. So obviously we're talking about in the most extreme circumstances, but you know each individual person can truly assess their level of fear. Some people it's just enough to say there's this peace pyramid they're gonna leave us alone. They don't want to lose their job. They don't want to lose their you know their situation. So for what it's worth, for what for what it's worth. Thank you guys so much, panel, for all this great information. That was a great presentation with a lot of information. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Pleasure.